Welcome to Fits to Speak from the Archives. I'm Eugene Nova. Glad as ever to be with you. It's been a little over two and a half years since the novel coronavirus pandemic gripped the world and things, for better or worse, are coming back to normal, such that it is. But as with many universities during that time, the college experience at the University of Maryland was anything but, particularly for one day in February of 2021, in which the university briefly shut down, which I commented on in a special edition of Fit to Speak, which we will revisit in a few minutes. two things I want to talk about to start off this finale. Earlier this month, U.S. President Joe Biden announced that Americans who have been convicted of marijuana possession at the federal level will be pardoned. Now, this is via executive order. And considering the president's stance over the years on marijuana, this is a big freaking deal. Remember that the DEA still, perhaps for now, has the green leafy substance as a Schedule I drug right up there with heroin and LSD. According to the Biden administration, over 6,500 people will benefit from this executive action. I applaud this move tremendously because, among other reasons, this will start a crescendo of legalizing marijuana in the United States, which I support, as well as perhaps other drugs, and maybe this will provide the opportunity to reform our alcohol laws, much of our puritanical alcohol laws as well. I will lay out these reasons in an exclusive Substack article for paid subscribers, so go to csemedia.substack.com right now and become a paid subscriber today for as little as $5 a month so that you can see the article. Finally, I was fortunate enough to meet, as I do every year at the Ocean City Film Festival in Ocean City, Maryland, other independent filmmakers, including Melissa Jo Peltier, who wrote and directed this film, The Game Is Up, which I highly, highly recommend. It's a must-see as we count down the days, yes, days, to the midterms. you're in the conservative media world like I was in, you are told to say every day that Donald Trump walks on water. I was told by my bosses to only say good things about Donald Trump. I told them to go. Most of our opinions about Donald Trump do not come from CNN or from MSNBC or from Fox. Most of our opinions about Donald Trump come from Donald Trump himself. People say, oh, I should get over it, I should move on, but it's like, how can you? I mean, they lie about liberals, lie about Democrats, lie about Trump. It's kind of hard to just move on. I know quite a few uh, people my age who are in the Republican Party who they're thinking about leaving the Republican Party. They're thinking about leaving this Trumpism, this phenomenon. I threw up the red flag, I threw up the white flag, I threw up whatever I could throw up as a warning that this was bad agricultural policy and it was gonna hurt us for a long time. I was reading the Bible and reading some scripture and, in the, and, the, and some verses jumped out at me. And I had to repent for that. I, I, I said, God, I am sorry for voting for him. What does Jesus say? Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Where is that love God, love neighbor, love self? It, that's the kingdom of God. And what we're living with right now is Christianity that is about empire, not kingdom of God. This is not a political issue. This virus does not care. It doesn't care the color of your skin. It doesn't care about the God to whom you pray. It infects, it spreads like wildfire, and it can kill you. Game over. The trailer you just saw, folks, perfectly encapsulates why I believe the film was the highlight of the 2022 festival. This is not a film that's going to beat you over the head with how much the former and twice impeached U.S. president sucks, okay? This is a very measured film. 
This this has got real people in it. Uh, a farmer, a U.S. Army vet, people of faith, and others who supported Trump and at great personal risk at that. One of the other folks among the core of the film was former congressman and presidential candidate Joe Walsh, who, while not an enthusiastic supporter, tried to see the good such that it is in Trump. And what I really want you to pay attention to in this film is Congressman Walsh's transformation from right-wing provocateur, right, you know, such that, you know, that, you know, may be, that transformation from right-wing provocateur who, you know, really at a minimum planted the seeds for one of the people who planted the seeds for Trump's rise, you know, and all, you know, he just, you know, watered, you know, this stuff right there to somebody who is trying and I think has really succeeded by and large to making sure that those plants that have those seeds that have since germinated, right? That those seeds that have since germinated are now being cut down to size. That, that's one of the main takeaways that I really want you to pull from this. It is truly a sight to behold. And in talking with him at the festival back in March, I know that he's the real deal. And that eradication of those plants, okay, that really allowed for the kind of nonsense that we see today, that spirit of eradication of this, this rise, that's a spirit that carries, I believe, throughout the film. It really, really does. And it's just very amazing, you know, to see. And the beauty, the other beauty of this film is that this does a great job of weaving in experts uh, from all you know places to really understand the cult that, and let's call it what it is. This is a cult uh, of, of support for Trump and everything else. I thought that the film really did a great job there. And the other thing is, you know, they really do a good job of really weaving in some of these contemporary issues from, you know, Russian influence in the election and also as well the kind of sort of odds between Christianity and, the, you know, the Christian and, and those values and the kind of values that Trump espouses. So those are definitely at odds. And I thought that the film did a good job of exploring those subjects. I enjoyed tremendously how well the film was structured. Everybody gets a segment. And The Game Is Up has the potential of not only impacting the midterms, but the presidential election in 2024. This is without question the film to show your Trump supporting friends or anyone who needs something to help move them off the fence or just wants to watch truly one of the best films based on current events that I've seen in my relatively short time on this planet. Melissa, her team, and everybody involved in the making of The Game Is Up should be very, very, very proud of what they've achieved. A massive, massive congratulations on the success of the film, um, especially across the festival circuit. And this is a such an important film. Uh, that needs to be, as far as I'm concerned, in feeders nationwide and not a moment too soon. You do have the ability right now for as little as $5 to watch The Game Is Up from the comfort of your living room or wherever you are on Amazon Prime Video. We'll have a link to it in the YouTube description below. Do yourself a favor and watch this film. For the sake of our populace and our society, you'll really be glad you did. Welcome to Fit to Speak. I'm Eugene Oba. So glad to have you with us. Today, I will provide some commentary on the recent developments on the impacts of the novel coronavirus pandemic at the University of Maryland, and what I believe needs to be done as we recently surpassed the grim milestone of half a million Americans killed from this virus. You 
know, folks, there has been hell in a shell at the University of Maryland over the last week or so. Um, the news that has been going around really should not be a surprise to anyone, especially those who have been following all of the developments on campus this academic year. In the last week of February, the University of Maryland went into an entirely virtual learning model for a week on the back of increasing cases of the coronavirus on campus. We enumerated this lockdown or sequester in place, as it were, on the February 25th edition of this program, and it's an episode worth revisiting right here on this YouTube channel. Now, the situation at the University of Maryland, let's be clear, this is not unique to University of Maryland. Uh, a lot of places are going through this. The, the virus, really, uh, knows no boundaries. But it serves as a reminder that even with a massive decline in cases in the U.S., we are still in a global pandemic. Yes, folks, we are still in a global pandemic right here. With so many people killed around the world, including now over half a million Americans, and we're going to be in this for a long while to come. And the worst thing is, folks, it did not have to be this way. It just didn't. It did not have to be this way. But sadly, this is where we've ended up. And it's a shame. It really is. And that decline that I mentioned earlier may very well be short-lived as Dr. Rochelle Walensky, CDC director, warned last week. But the latest data suggests that these declines may be stalling, potentially leveling off at still a very high number. We at CDC consider this a very concerning shift in the trajectory. We are watching these concerning data very closely to see uh, where they will go over the next few days. But it's important to remember where we are in the pandemic. Things are tenuous. Now is not the time to relax restrictions. Most recently, Dr. Anthony Fauci, in an interview with CNN's Dana Bash, said it is possible that people will be wearing masks in 2022. Yes, next year. Next year, people will be wearing masks. Given the attitudes that some Americans have taken in terms of wearing masks and socially distancing and following the rules, and you even have some idiots who are convinced that somehow there is absolutely zero flu. I wish I was making that stuff up. I think that the good doctor was a little generous in saying that 2022 would be the time that, you know, people will be still wearing masks. I think if you add 10 years to that, I think that's where the U.S. will be. Now, what I think about what's happening at the University of Maryland, it's a pity. I think it's sad what's happening. And it just goes to show that I think that the hybrid model that is, you know, having the in-person classes and then having some classes that are entirely virtual, to me, it's not working. It, it, it's not working. This should not have even been a thing, okay? This should not be a thing. The University of Maryland, really no university for that matter, should have even entertained the thought of having this hybrid model. It, it, it just should not have been a thing. And it's not just people like myself who are saying that. You had a lot of folks that really were, were questioning the decision of the university when the university did make the decision to go to do this hybrid. Like, why? Why, why, why do this when you have schools like Howard University and Georgetown? I'm naming schools that are very close proximity to the University of Maryland, um, just you know, miles away. Um, American University, George Washington. Even up the road, further up the road, about 40, 45 minutes up the road, Johns Hopkins, who, who has been the supplier of a lot of data that's been going out about COVID in general, you know, because of their strong reputation in medicine. And these, all these schools went virtual very early on. They went virtual. So, you know, folks were, were wondering, including myself, were wondering what makes the University of Maryland so confident that, you know, our populace on campus, our students, faculty and staff are going to be immune to this. Why, why take the chance? That clip was from our New Year's Eve edition, and that was at the time where, of course, everybody was just so happy to say goodbye to 2020. Well, I do want you to say hello again to that episode on vimeo.com slash CSE Media, where Salman, he really drops a lot of truths here on this. He really does. As I've mentioned on this program, college students in many ways are getting their first taste of freedom from being bound to the pesky rules of their parents. And remember, in most college towns across America, and most certainly around the world, it's not just the campus that people will be on. 
they'll be at off-campus parties, restaurants, and yes, the typical rite of passage, the bars and the clubs, of which long lines on Friday and Saturday nights, even during a pandemic, are the norm. And the fact that Dr. Spirina Marino Poulos, University Health Center Director, stated in this article from the Diamondback that the recent spike in COVID cases on campus can be attributed in large part to small gatherings and dorms doesn't surprise me. Nor does it surprise me to read that students in 27 residential buildings, including fraternity and sorority housing, are in isolation or quarantine housing. If you subtract the Greek housing and just focus on the traditional dorms and campus-owned suites and apartments, that is a smidge over 44% of campus housing that have been impacted. There are 54 residence halls on the University of Maryland campus. We need to get real folks. As the CDC director correctly points out, the virus isn't over. We may be done with the virus, but clearly the virus is not done with us. We cannot get comfortable or give in to a false sense of security that the worst of the pandemic is behind us. Stuff like what is happening at the University of Maryland will continue to happen, not unless the attitudes change. And remember that right now, as of the time of this recording, no college student is eligible to get the vaccine. Nobody knows what the post-pandemic future may hold whenever that comes which made it all the more interesting to me that the university was the first in the region to indicate its intent to return to entirely in-person learning in the fall, yes, with the proviso that conditions warrant. One thing is clear, folks. It's time right now for the tunnel to hide in its shell, at least for the balance of the semester. We've truly come a long way. Maybe not the idiot I mentioned earlier in the program who thought that there was no flu, but those of us with actual brain cells, we should be very lucky indeed. And I'm very, very lucky to have all of you watching. Thank you so much for watching Fit to Speak from the Archives. This has been a great past 13 weeks. Um, we hope that the conversations that we have shared with you over that time have been worthwhile. Now, the regular edition of Fit to Speak will come back November 23rd. That's right. The return of Fit to Speak from this extended break is coming at you the day before Thanksgiving here in the U.S. We hope to see you then. In the meantime, be sure to follow us on all of our social media accounts and be sure to check out our Substack and Patreon pages for exclusive content and to support all the work that we do here. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell on our YouTube channel so that you do not miss any of our episodes. I'm Eugene Nova again. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you for Fit to Speak in November. Until then, remember, the best things in life are worth saving. <laughs> <laughs>